Hello, with this Q&A video, I would like to reply to several comments by a user called Sven Hertz. It's a new and empty profile, which I encounter quite often uh, on YouTube. But I mean, basically, I'm uh, open to discussion, of course, and the questions this user uh, brings forward are quite good. So I decided to produce this little Q&A video. So Sven Hertz feels that my interpretation of Beethoven's music, or more particularly uh, of Beethoven's Piano Sonata in F minor, Opus 2, number 1, is historically inaccurate. Uh, and he brings forward three main reasons for that. First of all, Beethoven was young when he wrote that Piano Sonata. Uh, he was a spitfire, he was energetic. It was the time of Napoleon, times were very uncertain. So why would he play so slowly, so meditatively? Second, reported durations. There are a few durations of actual performance during Beethoven's lifetime, and Sven Hertz says that these durations do not support uh, slow playing. In fact, they are quite similar to what we are used to today. And third aspect is a musical aspect. There he writes, for instance, where are the rough edges? Where is the motoric? Where is the dancing? Wasn't Beethoven a man of extreme contrasts? If we talk about something like that, there is uh, one thing that is important for us to always keep in mind. The picture isn't black and white. When we consult sources from the late 18th and 19th century, then we encounter amazing things, surprising things, and quite a lot of contrary things. And we just have to live with that. We have to include everything in our picture, even if that resulting picture is not unambiguous, is contrary even sometimes. So let me start with the musical aspects. So the comment is, where are the rough edges? Where is the motoric? Where is the dancing? Wasn't Beethoven a man of extreme contrasts? First of all, obviously that is a matter of taste, but moderate tempo does not mean that there are no rough edges. In my opinion, on the contrary, really, there is more roughness in terms of articulation than in a fast tempo. The prestissimo out um, of Opus 2 number 1 is a good example for that. In my tempo, I can articulate the left hand quite roughly, which I cannot do when I play it too fast. Then the dancing. It's the same here, really. When does a piece of music start to dance and when does it not? That is not so clear. As a matter of fact, I encounter people who tell me the exact opposite of Sven Hertz. They say that with that slower tempo, they can finally dance along to classical music. So people perceive that differently. If we take uh, the movement out of Opus 2, number one, that is actually a dance movement, because on the general note, this is no dance music, it's a piano sonata. But if we take the one movement that goes back to a dance movement, the menuet, uh, uh, the third movement, then we see that my recording is around 116 for the quarter note. That's a tempo you can absolutely find in slow waltzes, for instance. It's that range. So it is a dance tempo. You can still find it too slow, but it is a dance tempo. There is no such thing as a general statement that slow tempi wouldn't fit with dance movements. I actually encourage you, Sven Hertz and everybody who watches this video, to try it out. Turn on my recording and try to dance along to the menuet or the entire sonata, if you wish. And maybe we'll discover something surprising. Who knows? <laughs> 
All right, second durations. So Sven Hertz uh, says that the durations that are reported from Beethoven's time do not support uh, a slow tempo. In fact, they support a tempo that is quite similar to what we are used to today. Here as well, the picture isn't black and white. Let's take the Eroica Symphony by Beethoven, for instance. There is a review of a performance of that symphony uh, from April 1805 under Beethoven's very own direction in Vienna. I talked about that in my part number three of my general introduction to historical metronome markings and tempo. In this review, the reviewer reports that the performance lasted one full hour, so 60 minutes. If you take that and look at the ominous issue of single beat versus double beat, then we realize <laughs> that this duration doesn't match either of them. If we understand uh, Beethoven's metronome markings the way we understand it today, that is a single beat, then the resulting duration is around 40 minutes. If you understand the metronome markings, Beethoven's own metronome markings, uh, really. If you understand them along to double beat, then the result is 80 minutes. Now, where does this leave us with 60 minutes? Somewhere in between. Right in between, actually. <laughs> so, the variable approach to metronome markings, which I talked about several times, would result in about 64 minutes for the Eroica, so quite close. So there are documents such as this uh, review that show a discrepancy between metronome markings and reported durations. And with 20 minutes, that discrepancy isn't small. It's considerable. Theories such as the double beat theory try to offer explanations for that kind of phenomenon. And that is all I'm saying. If you watch my general introduction to historical metronome markings and tempo, which is available both in German and English here on YouTube, then you will notice that I try to present all aspects, the pros as well as the con cons, so to speak, and as far as it is possible within the short time of an online presentation. And I think we have to do exactly that, because if we don't, then we do what Paul Simon sings about in his famous boxer song, a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. And we don't want to do that. There are documents that report an amazing level of slowness in the 19th century, such as the Nose Fantasy by Franz Liszt. I wrote an entire book about that. And there are documents that report tempi or durations that are similar to the ones we are used to today. And we have to live with that ambiguity of things. Finally, Beethoven as a spitfire, as a young, energetic man, why would he play so slowly? Here as well, we have to take the whole picture into consideration. Tempo is only one aspect, one part of interpretation. Everybody who is a stage performer knows about the importance of stage presence. If you enter a stage and if you own that stage, then people will hang on your lips, no matter what tempo you choose. So the impact of a performance is way more a question of energy and personality than purely technical playing, and certainly than tempo, pure tempo uh, in terms of speed. In addition, and every stage performer knows that as well, you play differently every time. You change the tempo all the time. You adapt to the occasion, the instrument, the room, your mood, the effect you want to, to get out of this performance and things like that. So you are flexible. And the metronome marking for Opus 2 number 1 doesn't even origin in the time when Beethoven composed the piece. It origins decades later. It was given by Carl Czerny 
and Beethoven was already dead. <laughs> so that leaves a lot of options. Okay, to sum this up, let's try to keep the whole picture in mind, to take the whole picture into account when we talk about things like that. Everybody is entitled not to like my play, to think it's too slow and even to think that it is uh, unlikely or inaccurate against the background of music history. But in terms of arguments, we have to admit that there is more than one option. And isn't that wonderful? <laughs> isn't that great? We are entitled to explore different versions, different tempi, to experiment with tempo and to see what comes out of it. I think that's wonderful, it's lovely and great, and I really wouldn't want to miss that. Okay, those are my thoughts on these uh, good points that Sven Hertz brought forward, and I hope this was helpful. If you have further questions, don't hesitate to ask in the comments. I try to reply within a reasonable amount uh, of time, but sometimes I'm just too busy to do so, so I ask your uh, patience <laughs> uh, regarding that. Okay, thank you for your attention and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.